When you set up a document, we do not have to use spot colors literally. We don't have to say, I want a specific color of ink. Yes, the easiest way to use a spot color is to define a specific color to be used when printing. Coca-Cola Red is usually the go-to example when talking about spot colors, but many brands have used Pantone spot colors to define what the color for their brand is and how to be consistent about showing that color. I found this cool website, brandpalettes.com. If you click on it, you can click on any um, big company around the world and it will tell you what the closest Pantone spot color is to, or I guess the p closest Pantone color is to their brand color. However, the use of spot colors is not limited to printing physical colors. They can be used to define and communicate additional information to a commercial printer beyond what color to print. They can be used to identify cut, score, fold, and perforation lines when creating a die line. You can also identify where a project would need or require glue. You can identify the placement of a spot color or, sorry, a spot coating or a varnish. You can even tell a digital print a printer, not the person who does the printing, but the machine, when to perform specific tasks like cutting the use of ink colors to activate variable data printing. There are a number of things that spot colors can be used for. So when we talk about spot colors, um, there are some kind of go-to's that you should know. If someone says, what are spot colors used for? They are used to specify ink colors to print, dye lines, glue tabs and glue panels, spot coatings and varnishes, um, I'm going to say spot coatings and varnishes because there are ways to do coatings that don't require a die line. If you do an overall coating, you don't need a die line for that. You can also use it for specific equipment needs. And like I said in our example here, we use the cut contour swatch or spot color swatch to activate die cutting or, or uh, plotting on our Roland VersaCam printer in the lab. Die lines are the communication of cut, score, which are fold lines, and perforations in a document destined for print. You wouldn't do this in a digital document because there's no way to do any of those things in a digital document. Die lines are used to identify where a product cuts if it does not trim to a flat sided rectangle. If you're going to trim something to a square or a rectangle that has 90 degree corners, you're going to use what's called a guillotine cutter, which just cuts straight lines. When you're identifying on a die line where something is going to cut, you're going to use straight lines with your pen tool. You can also identify where a product will fold and or score, and you'll use dash lines for that. You can use the die line to identify where it folds, but you can go one step above that to identify where it should score. And what we do with the die is we press a rounded piece of metal against everywhere it should fold to make an indent. So if someone had to hand fold these, these packages here, the product would naturally want to fold where it's been creased for us. We can also identify where a product should perforate to allow something to tear out of a book or a project or maybe a little tab that you collect the points for something on and we'll use dotted lines to identify that. I found this really cool die line online um, and so I've linked to it here if you want to find more information about this specific die line. Die lines are most often used for packaging type items like boxes, envelopes, folders, etc. And you can see that I just have a few examples here. They're not abiding by our um, they're not abiding by our dash dotted straight line, but they are examples how you can see that in an envelope, for example, must be cut into this weird kind of funky shape so when it folds down it could turn into an envelope. You can see that same package from the previous example. And then you can see this is a pocket folder and it will fold along these dash lines. This is a glue tab, so you'll apply glue and fold it up to make a pocket. And this pocket folder actually has a capacity which makes it thicker so you can put more things into the folder. If it just had one dash line, it would fold in half, but in this case, it needs to be folded twice. But die lines do not have to just be used for packaging type items. Die lines can also be used to identify complex folds that do not adhere to traditional simple folding patterns. In the previous lecture, we learned how to set up an InDesign booklet document for complex fold-out panels. The most appropriate way to set up that type of document is to add two additional pages for each additional fold-out panel and then figure out where they land in the page sequencing of the document. However, that method is not always the most appropriate when designing a project with complex folds. If the item with the complex fold has a rectangular flat size, which means it requires no custom cuts. It doesn't need a die line to be able to cut the outside of the shape. 
It can be cut with a traditional guillotine cutter or a straight cutter, and custom die line can be used to just identify where the folds are. A map fold is a great example of this. A map fold should be created in InDesign using one large page for the front and one large page for the back of the map. So if you're creating your InDesign document, it would just have two pages. Then you would add a die line to identify where the product needs to fold, whether you're going to use a folding machine to fold it, so you're just trying to communicate to the printer where you want it to fold, or you want to actually die, die cut it, but instead of cutting, you would die score it, which means you would press a flat blade against the piece of paper to create an indent to make it easier to fold. The map can still be trimmed on four sides using that guillotine cutter we talked about, but the folding pattern must be identified using a die line. And so on the right here, this is an example that can be considered a map or a poster fold, and it has a custom fold pattern, but notice it's just a rectangle sheet of paper. I could cut the four sides of that using a guillotine cutter and then fold the map or the poster, whatever it happens to be. This is a custom fold here too, and this is a different example. So if it lays flat, it's still a rectangle, but I need to identify kind of the weird funky folds here that would allow it to fold down into a book and then open up kind of like a pop-up book. It's not a, a traditional pop-up book, but it kind of unravels like a pop-up book. I would never be able to fold that on a folding machine, but I could use a die scoring machine to score everywhere that it's going to fold, so if someone was folding this by hand, they would be able to do it more easily than trying to figure out or guess where the folds need to be. There are some limitations of custom fold die lines, and you should be aware of that when you start to experiment with this option. It is a misconception to think that if you yourself can physically fold a project, then it must be physically possible for a commercial printing company to also fold that product. Commercial folding machines have width, length, and number of fold type limitations. Always consult with your output service provider before finalizing a complex fold design. Hand folding a million items is going to cost an astronomical amount compared to automating that folding process with a folding machine. So if you design something that's really cool, but it can't physically be folded on a folding machine, which would automate the process and speed it up, somebody could fold that for you. You could pay someone to sit into the bindery and to fold product by hand. But something that's folded by hand is going to cost 20 times more than something folded on a machine. So we could go on and on and on about really cool custom folds and custom die lines, but I think it's easier to kind of just look at some examples. Uh, Trish, and I do not want to butcher her last name, so I'm not even going to attempt to say it, has a really cool YouTube channel, and it's the 60 Second Super Cool Fold of the Week. Um, each video that she has explains a cool, actual printed item that has a unique fold or a custom die line. And what I really like about it is she tells you all about the production of the item and how it needed to be produced. She'll note whether or not the product required hand folding. And oftentimes when she says, oh, this is a custom fold, they had to fold this by hand, she'll note that they only made a hundred of them or they only made a thousand of them. And it's usually a very small quantity. She's never going to say, oh, this was printed and they made 35 million copies of it and it required hand folding because it's just not practical. And so if you're interested, check out her YouTube account. Um, I've linked to it down here. I don't want to click on it because when you upload other people's videos on YouTube, you'll get copyright issues and I don't want that to happen to this video. Thank <laughs> you.